Hey there, I'm Sean Kevlin, CEO of the Insurance Information Institute. Like IIS, uh, IIII is now part of the Institute. So we're both affiliates, uh, part of a uh, nearly 20 member affiliate organization. Uh, really happy to be here with you all and introduce this next panel, which I'm sure you'll find very interesting around embedded insurance. Um, as our theme here uh, with this, with the IIS Global Forum is the great reset. I think embedded insurance is really one of those key items that, that we're looking at in terms of what happened through COVID, what happens as we're bringing more innovation into our industry and really enhancing the customer experience. And that's really what I think embedded insurance will do. Uh, oftentimes we find that people aren't really thinking about insurance and risk management um, during a point of sale. Um, and that point of sale is just so convenient uh, as you're buying a car or buying a house to just go ahead and get your insurance product right then and there and not have to worry about it later on in the process, perhaps when it might be too late. Um, so it makes the, the point of sale and the transaction of insurance much easier, I think. Um, and really we found that this embedded insurance is coming through a lot of the digital enhancements that we're beginning to see embedded into the industry as well, pun intended. Uh, so with that, I think you'll also find that this panel has a really a broad range of global risk management perspectives, which is going to make this very interesting. So I'd like to introduce to you now, Jamie Crystal. He's the executive chairman of MIC Global. Um, he'll be our moderator for the panel and he'll feature both global and, and regional perspectives, as I mentioned. And remember the title here is Shaping the Future of Distribution Through Embedded Insurance. Hello and welcome to Shaping the Future of Distribution Through Embedded Insurance. My name is Jamie Crystal. I'm the uh, executive chairman of MIC Global. MIC Global is a uh, microinsurance and embedded insurance specialty company. We just launched a syndicate at Lloyd's in July of this year, and I'm very pleased to be here with you today. I am joined by uh, two of my uh, colleagues on this panel, uh, Bruno Scaroni, Chief Tech uh, Group Chief Transformation Officer at Generali, and also with Eduardo Forbeja at Asa, uh, Asa Corporacion. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for joining me here today, and I'm looking very much looking forward to our discussion. Embedded insurance is about getting more affordable, relevant, and personalized insurance to people when and where they need it most. Um, embedded insurance has tremendous potential to help close the protection gap, which is the difference between the level of coverage that is economically and socially beneficial and what is actually brought, bought. It has been described as a $3 trillion market opportunity. Um, embedded insurance, more generally, is part of a broader movement towards embedded finance about getting more affordable, relevant, and personalized financial products to people when and where they need it most. It's enabled by taking insurance functionality and combining that with technology so that we can partner with third-party organizations, what I call platform partners, can implement and seamlessly incorporate attractive either risk mitigation solutions or insurance products into their customer journeys. For insurers like us, it creates a potential for lowest, lower cost distribution uh, for individuals and their firms to, we do that by gaining, by leveraging data and um, enhancing product innovation. For investors and tech op entrepreneurs, it offers opportunities to create valuable new ventures. And for me, most importantly, for society as a whole, it helps as I noted, to, protect, to close the insurance protection gap or the difference between the level of coverage that is economically and socially beneficial and what is actually bought. So here we are today. It is, uh, we're closing into the fourth quarter of 2022 and embedded insurance has been around for some time. It is starting to gain substantial momentum. And I'm going to begin by asking our first question uh, for my panelists, is embedded insurance a board level priority for your company? And if so, why? I would like to ask Eduardo to start our discussion. Thank you, Eduardo. And thank you, Jamie. Uh, and thank you for uh, IIS for, for letting me participate in this panel. Um, and yes, and to answer your question, is is at the core of our strategy uh, at the board level. And, and maybe I can share a bit of, bit of a, a background and context. Uh, let's say from 2008 to, to, to 2018, we expanded our, our operations from our home base in Panama into the six countries of Central America, uh, also a JV in Colombia, 
and we started uh, reinsurance operations in, in Bermuda. Following, you know, organic and inor inorganic growth in Central America with acquisitions, uh, we acquired the AIG operations in, in Central America. We acquired the Generali operation in Panama and recently the Blue Cross Blue Shield operation in, in Costa Rica. In 2018, um, I went with my CIO to one of these IT conference and day one of the event, I learned that the industry digital level of maturity, let's call it from one to, to five was at two and a half, but only as a result of increased investments uh, on optimization of processes, contrary to real investments in, in digital as a means to transformation. Um, so in, in 2019, entering a strategic planning session with my board, I asked them to support me and my team in answering you know, five strategic questions that continue to be relevant in NASA and I assume everybody's company. You know? You know, how can we create a, or how can we improve value creation uh, was one of them. How can we unlock talent um, and demand uh, from customer experience and how can we overcome a uh, stagnant in productivity? Uh, how can we reimagine our employee value proposition and, and our talent retention? And of course, how can we wider the purpose uh, of the industry and the role in society? You know? and, and out of that uh, discussion, uh, you know, we prioritize our efforts and initiatives behind nine levers. Six of them uh, enable um, embedded insurance for ASA today. Uh, you know, the six being product innovation, customer experience, engaging in ecosystems and insure techs, um, scaling of the analytics. Um, one big initiative, is, which is modernizing our core platforms. Um, and reskilling of our talent. Um, so, you know, the reason why um, I think it was, it, it, it's easy. I mean, we, I felt that in 2018 that we were really behind uh, the, the, the market. So that's why we pushed this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. And uh, Bruno, I'm going to pose the same question to you. Uh, is embedded insurance a board level priority for your company and why? First of all, hello, Jamie. Hello, everyone. And thanks for having me. It's a privilege to be part of this panel. Uh, allow me just to say a couple of words about Generali, in which I currently have the privilege of uh, um, representing the uh, Chief Transformation Office. Uh, we are a longstanding company uh, that dates back to the 18th century. Uh, with uh, a great European foothold. Actually, in the European Union, we are market leaders uh, following the uh, Brexit uh, event. And we have pockets of businesses across uh, Asia and, and South America. And actually, with Eduardo, we share the common past in Panama. Um, as far as embedded insurance is concerned, I can, I can confirm you that this is surely a priority for Generali. And this is a kind of an amazing statement because uh, we are generally perceived as a tied agent led company that hence has a limited traction on embedded insurance and primarily a life business company. Nevertheless, uh, we realized, especially over the last few years, that the tied agent network on which we rely to have a complete alignment at the distribution level to serve our customers is a channel that is contracting in many geographies across the world, potentially more in life than in PNC. And hence, we need to find other distribution means, some of them being a traditional distribution means, like, say, bank distribution agreements, but also embedded insurance can be a significant part in order to capture growth, because most of the growth that we see on the market is being unleashed by the combination of uh, embedded insurance and digital. Digital has been a game changer in the embedded insurance space. Embedded insurance is not novelty. It's always been part of the, say, non-traditional distribution channels. I myself had an extensive experience on embedded insurance when I used to work for Europe Assistance. 
which is a company wholly owned by Generali that provides assistance uh, riders, but also uh, full-fledged um, uh, insurance contracts in the travel space. And it does rely on uh, alternative distribution channels in order to provide these uh, solutions. In some cases, the, uh, the, the, the channel for distributing is banks or travel agencies or cruise operators. In that sense, just to uh, stick on uh, the, uh, say, travel examples, uh, the digital um, uh, revolution has sparked uh, a completely new set of opportunities. If you think of uh, what is now being intermediated by online travel agencies versus uh, uh, traditional travel agencies, or what marketplaces can provide in terms of uh, being a, uh, a, a catalog of products and services that also include insurance. So all in all, I have to say that uh, we are pursuing embedded insurance opportunities, mostly in the retail space, and mostly to try and beef up the value proposition that we give with our traditional reimbursement um, capabilities with prevention services and assistance in uh, mobility, in health, and generally speaking, individual retail products. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Um, listening to both of you speak, I was trying to um, identify some high level reasons that are that I see also in our business about why embedded insurance should be of interest to insurers. And I think for me, there's five, five key areas. One, it helps us all to connect our capital to distribution. Uh, two, um, access to premium and specifically to more diversified frequency-based premium. A lot of us uh, on the insurance world spend an inor inordinate amount of time uh, writing cat exposed risk, big aggregations, long tail risk. And in contrast to me, Embedded insurance brings us back to some of our roots of writing much more of a diversified frequency-based premium, a nice uh, diversification of our portfolios. Uh, three, as Bruno noted, um, it's a very high growth business. When I think about uh, partnering with uh, different platform businesses, uh, the growth rate, typically we're following their growth. I call it surfing the growth wave. We just, we just ride that wave. And typically when we launch these types of products, we're seeing consistently 30% growth um, year over year. So with a, with a pipeline full of opportunities. Um, point four, I think, uh, very critical, which we're going to explore further in this discussion, is innovation. How do we connect um, the uh, changes in our society with the growth in technology? And last, which is, which is critical to all of us running our businesses, is how can we access new forms of premium in a profitable way? So um, I think we're off to a good start. I want to explore more, uh, Bruno. You 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 asked. Uh, you started to introduce uh, the concept that um, embedded insurance is not just with the traditional platforms. And by way of traditional platforms, I think of platform businesses such as banks and telecom and travel, um, but also with some of the 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 not so new, but the technology platforms. In this case, the gig economy, sharing economy, IoT devices, payment gateways. So I'm interested from both. Uh, uh, both uh, both of you, Bruno and Eduardo, do you see a, the opportunity in both the traditional platforms and in the tech platforms? Is it greater in one area or more? Or are you focusing in one area more than the other? Um, and if, if possible, if you could share with us maybe some examples of uh, some uh, some of your uh, some of your success. Um, instead of going back and forth, I'm going to mix it up a little bit. So, Bruno, maybe if if you could go first, I've given you a little opportunity to. Uh, to pause and, and catch your breath. And then after this, I'll ask Eduardo to share his thoughts. Sure, Jamie. First of all, some numbers and some rationale for pursuing strategies in the embedded insurance space. If we look at some value or revenue pools uh, for the next few years, the PNC insurance business in the EU is poised to grow by 2.3%. In the embedded insurance space, so in the B2B2C kind of like environment, this growth can reach 7% in the same time horizon. That is why we are looking at opportunities in this space. Now, what kind of opportunities? You rightly mentioned traditional versus non-traditional channels that are being digitally enabled. I will make a further distinction, also stemming on my uh, past experience in Europe assistance. 
you want to be partner with someone that is making money from its own business rather than on your business. What I mean by this, if you take, for example, online travel agents and uh, anything that relates to uh, sales of uh, flight tickets, the usual dynamic is that uh, these companies would buy flight tickets uh, from carriers uh, and uh, they would actually lose money because they would eventually promote the same ticket with a lower fare. And how would they make money? Out of the insurance that is being bundled with the same product. This is where I think you are finding the biggest hurdles to make B2B2C or embedded insurance profitable. Because you are dealing with the partners that rely on you entirely for their profitability. Let me make you one other example. If you partner up with a cruise operator, say uh, Carnival, Costa Crociera in Italy, MSC, uh, you, Silver Sea, you name it. These folks, as partners, they make their profits primarily on renting cabins. Then on top of that, they make another, say, additional margin of profitability on the travel product. I'm just sticking to a travel example because I think it makes things a little bit clearer. If that is the case, which partner you would opt for? Surely the one that does not need you to rely upon for its own profitability. Rather, you are an additional profit generator. This is applicable across the board. So if I take marketplaces and I make the example of Mercado Libre, that is a partner of Generali in Argentina and in other countries in South Africa, in sorry, South America that we are uh, evolving with. I mean, Mercado Libre makes money in Argentina, for example, by uh, dispatching products, goods that people are buying. Then essentially it might bundle some insurance coverages, say extended warranty on some of these products or given the one click away kind of dynamic in terms of relationship with the customer, it would make an even more compelling, uh, say, sales process to customers to acquire certain uh, contracts in the insurance space. But the bulk of the profitability of Mercado Libre is its own traditional business. It would be completely different if we were in a marketplace where the only product being made available is insurance. So all in all, I see opportunities in the telco, in the retail, in the utility space. The one thing that one needs to really bear in mind is making sure you find partners that have other pots of profitability rather than just yours. Because if that is the case, you are getting stripped on commissions and profit sharing. But also, if there is a tendency to um, cover the value proposition of the insurance coverage for making sure that claims do not occur. And this is a short-term gain because embedded insurance is something that client needs to value in its purchase. If it doesn't value it, well, he or she, I mean, it doesn't value it, sooner or later, there is either going to be a cancellation or some disgruntled customer that has been paying a price for something he has not enjoyed. He or she, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno and uh, Eduardo. If you could, if you could share your your thoughts and experience uh, with the group as well, specifically um, your experience working with traditional platforms such as banks and telecom, as well as with some of the the new newer tech platforms. Yes, I couldn't agree more with with Bruno. And 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 in other words, I mean, uh, the key for us has been selecting the right partners, those who own really the life event uh, and can offer the insurance behind the scenes. Uh, that's that's what that we're that we're looking for. You know, how to bundle for customers in a manner that solves the need for that life event uh, without having really having the customer make an insurance decision. Um, and, and of course, Jamie, uh, in, in Central America, uh, you know, short and medium, medium term, um, it's, 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 it's all about, uh, you know, traditional tech platforms uh, 
such as banks, telco, um, and 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 banks uh, primarily. No, the the use of of IoT um, will see it a more more long term, more as a means to processing a, on event, in an uneventual way a task for for customers' uh, involvement as much as possible. No. And so yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, with with Bruno. Um, you know, in terms in terms of um, of, of of key success, um, you know, from 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 my experience, um, you know, this is a multi year commitment. Uh, you know, to do embedded insurance, lots of platform building must come first. Um, you know, we don't. You don't have to uh, immediately expect uh, returns. Uh, so yeah, it, it it requires major commitment from from the organization. Thank you, Eduardo. Um, now we'll get into maybe something a little bit more fun fun to talk about. Possibly, uh, I think uh, when I think about embedded insurance, we in order to learn, we have we will make mistakes. We'll figure out what those mistakes are. We'll brush ourselves up and, and go to the to the next one. So, uh, Eduardo, maybe if you could share with us um, what I call an embedded insurance stumble <laughs> and also an embedded insurance success story. Yeah, I would like to start with the the, the success story first. I mean, um, and and I and I thought about uh, two. One being more traditional, um, I think uh, for us, uh, our partnership with with Uber has been a success story. Um, we basically insured uh, all the rights and the passengers for every ride uh, here in, in Panama and, and in Costa Rica. Um, that's worked fantastic. Uh, we use, I mean, we use their platform and it's seamless for the customer. They have insurance once they, they ask uh, for the ride, um, so that's more on the on the traditional side. On the non-traditional success story, I, I think of uh, our insurance product um, that we're launching in Colombia called Cafe Seguro. Um, we co-own uh, Blue Marble Micro Insurance. Uh, Blue Marble is um, represents an important part of our ESG story. We started a partnership with Nespresso in Colombia four years ago, and we worked with farmers cooperatives to understand and map their key risks to their coffee plants throughout the crop cycle. And we customized a uh, parametric solutions for them. We then created the entire ecosystem to service the product, including the mechanisms to finance the premiums and risk value chain to provide sustainable diversified risk capital. Um, this was a start of a long journey to provide insurance protection to all Nespresso coffee farmers worldwide. And we are expanding this venture uh, into Guatemala, Indonesia, Kenya, and Zimbabwe. And we have plans to reach out for more. Uh, as of right now, this program serves about 12,000 uh, small farmers in, in Colombia. And we're looking to expand it to thirty-eight thousand next year. Um, so, for for us, that's a that's a success story uh, here here in NASA um, because we're not just uh, we're we're also sharing value uh, with our small farmers. A stumble, uh, I think about uh, our our travel business, and and it had to do more with uh, partnering with the wrong uh, provider and our web application was a usability nightmare and we had delays for about eight months so um, replacing it and doing it internally is at the core of our digital lab right now thank you eduardo and, uh, very impressive uh, what, what you're doing um, in, in both of your examples um, Bruno, I'm going to ask uh, the same for you. If you could share with us maybe uh, some of your uh, insurance stumble, an insurance stumble, and an insurance success story. Um, I have uh, a couple of stories that could have uh, both ends, uh, in the sense that uh, on the flip side you would have some learnings, and on the right side you would have surely some success. So uh, one area in which we are strongly uh, focusing on is uh, mobility. 
because as generally we've been building internal capabilities to manage IoT, so Internet of Things and telematics. And in the standardization process of IoT, cars, so mobility, is by far the, um, say, market or segment in which uh, there's a higher degree of standardization and potentially the greater opportunity to serve uh, companies across many different markets. In that sense, we do participate in all tenders run by OEMs, so car manufacturers, in order to provide motor insurance. But motor is just to start with. You can then build up CPIs, extended warranty, assistance, and a full set of services to uh, you know, complement uh, the insurance contract. What is, say, the stumble that we sometimes fall into? The fact that we have different degrees of appetite depending on the market, different risk carrier capabilities depending on the market, and consequently different value propositions. This is something that for OEMs, for fleet managers, for rental companies, is very hard to understand the localism of insurance companies also due to their higher degree of regulation contrary to their own industries. Sometimes we do win because we do have uh, our telematic capabilities being properly appreciated by our customers. Some other times we lose because we cannot provide a single pricing and a single service model across different markets. And this is also taking into account the geographies that we might not cover. So, for example, Scandinavia, which has relatively small countries in terms of population, but relatively rich ones, and hence many, say, high-level or top-segment car manufacturers who want the coverages and partnership also in these regions of the world. Let me make you another example, still stemming from my assistance experience. At some point, uh, we ran a tender with Enel, that is uh, the Italian electricity incumbent, that is the one that provides uh, um, electricity to pretty much uh, the entire population. Well, the, the market is really liberalized, but they own a considerable market share and they are market leaders. We did win that uh, tender to provide assistance for heating and air conditioning systems across the entire territory. So the full spectrum of Italy from north to south. That gave us, on one hand, the incredible opportunity to build a network of uh, um, anyone that is a maintenance operator in the space of heating and uh, conditioning systems. So we did have the opportunity to build the network that eventually was an asset that we could potentially open up to other players, not just in the energy provision market, but also or utilities, but also in the telco space or in the property management space or even at the insurance level. On the other hand, we priced the, uh, the program wrongly. There was much more take up uh, you know, of services than what we were supposed to uh, get. This was also because of promotional activities by our partners, and hence the profitability of the contract was negative. But you have to take this bet in the B2B2C space or embedded insurance space, especially when you run into unknown territories, because if you are even in non-profitable, say, uh, areas, you have the drawback, which is the side effect, which is a positive one, uh, which is the buildup of networks that can eventually become an asset for other purposes. So I'm not sure I answered your question. I gave you different perspectives on the same deals, but how you can see that one deal could be potentially a spark for additional ones in the future. So as is to say, an investment for building capabilities that then could be deployed elsewhere. Thank, thank you, Bruno. I think... Um... This is both the challenge and the opportunity in the embedded insurance space. When I'm discussing uh, our strategy within our company, MIC Global, I think of uh, four areas that we focus on with kind of to be to provide forward thinking digital insurance solutions uh, with our partners. Uh, first is we tried to make sure that we are providing very simple and relevant embedded insurance for platform businesses, their customers or their service providers. And simple because you, we, we need the technology to be able to 
drive the process with straight through processing to take the frictional costs out and relevant because I don't necessarily want to provide crack screen insurance and sell it in a restaurant. That just to me is not relevant. So trying to find those partners where the insurance offerings are relevant and consistent with their business. Uh, the second one is to be able to leverage technology and principles of straight through processing to create embedded insurance solutions for the platform businesses. Um, if we're not really providing anything uh, unique and making the customer journey more, um, more uh, direct, then we, we run the risk of not adding value to uh, the platform partner or to their customers. Third is, um, I think there's a tremendous opportunity, and I was listening to something that uh, Bruno, you said earlier about not just trying to sell insurance on a platform so they can make their money there, but how do we try and find ways where we can enhance the brand or differentiate the product in addition to driving the revenue for our platform partners? And I think that's the key is to find those special use cases. And I think, Eduardo, your example with Nespresso is a very, very, um, very good one. Uh, being able to not only help their business because by helping their small their farmers throughout Colombia and in other countries, um, that is their source of product, that is their supply chain, but also to be able to have an, an ESG impact um, kind of ticks multiple multiple boxes. And lastly, is I, I think the, the core of embedded insurance is we're all are able to provide when we're able to provide highly relevant insurance that is accessible and affordable and efficient we now are able to extend a critical safety net to people that do not have ready access to insurance. So I think for me, it is a core business, both providing growth and profitability, but also having a, having a social impact. Um, now, I know for, for my experiences and I'm expecting for yours, and I think you each alluded to this, um, it is not easy just to decide in, you know, in a day we're going to do embedded insurance. How difficult is it to bring to market digital solutions? What are some of your internal challenges associated with this and how did you overcome them? Um, Eduardo, maybe if I could ask you to, uh, to share your, your, your experiences internally. Yeah, uh, absolutely, uh, uh, Jamie, and, and it's a challenge. Um, yeah, and, and in, in, as I mentioned at the early, uh, early in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in the meeting, uh, in 2019, we decided um, to take on the uh, digitalization of, of ASA, uh, you know, by discussing three three alternatives. No, uh, do a full digitalization of of our business, which I mean, ASA is a, both a PNC and a life insurance company. Um, develop a new insurance company, a new digital insurance company, and um, and the ones we chose, which was basically do selective digital interventions across uh, our core processes, no? Um, so we we are developing uh, our technology in-house, in uh, but we are open uh, to partners with, with InsureTechs. Um, as we started in, in 2020 with our digital lab, uh, with two, two squads of 10 employees, today we have about 30% of the company is working on their agile methodology uh, using both Scrum and Kanban methodologies. Um, and we're aiming to take the company to 50% of our employees by 2023 uh, working on their agile methodology. Today, we have uh, about seven uh, squads that are developing software and digital solutions. Um, and as I mentioned, I, we do it mainly in-house, but we are open for for to, for other providers and insure techs. Uh, you know, we consider our countries are very small, and we consider that our technology and platforms represent a competitive advantage, and and our core capacity and know-how, um, and we want to keep it keep it internal. No, um, so far we have uh, out of out of uh, our digital labs. Uh, good success stories uh, in terms of of scaling. Um, one of our squads, which is um, basically an end-to-end uh, auto insurance uh, uh, distribution platform, um, we started with an MVP uh, 18 months ago, and to, today we are selling about 6,500 policies per month, starting uh, out of 3,500 
pre-COVID, which is which is an, an important growth for us. Um, and out of our, um, we're also planning to scale uh, our life coach, which is a, basically a digital sales tool support to, to modern customer journey. Um, and in 12, 12 months, we're expecting uh, as well, double uh, growth by using um, our digital our digital solutions but but it's a challenge um, it requires as, a, as I mentioned earlier um, you know hiring and reskilling uh, your employees um, I always suggest that um, you you get the your POs internally um, and you can hire your your UX and or and your UIs and your architects uh, from from outside. Those are difficult to get from your traditional company. Um, and you know, stay focused. Um, you know, I spend about five hours a week uh, in in decision making groups, um, and we try to govern from you know efficiencies to enhancing customer experience and and building the needed data to support every decision that 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 we're making thank you eduardo uh bruno um do you, i have a one to understand is um eduardo suggested some of the challenges around technology do you does generally develop its technology in-house do you partner with technology providers do you partner with InsurTechs? How, how do you make those decisions uh, inside Generali? Well, actually, you are spot on because I think the IT side of business is surely the one element that uh, potentially breaks or makes these uh, opportunities uh, in the embedded insurance space. And let me say that uh, traditional companies like us that rely upon tight agents they usually have legacy systems that are pretty uh, hermetic. They're pretty closed. They do not allow uh, to um, you know, provide uh, coverages or riders onto someone else's platform. They do not, um, they are not built on APIs. And hence, if you try to use uh, these systems, you're always going to be in a suboptimal state because you are trying to adapt. Whereas, what makes the difference in the embedded insurance space, in my belief, is hunger. Hunger for distribution that you cannot build otherwise. And the hunger sort of forces you to build something from scratch that is uh, easily connectable to other, say, platforms that would eventually manage the client relationship. But it's not just the APIs so or the connection, it's the buildup of the product. If you want to build products that are geared towards embedded insurance, these need to be simplified products with very easy, say, selling pitches and uh, uh, you know product processes and claims management that are far faster and potentially more appealing in terms of customer satisfaction than the traditional, say, management of claims that will run through claims department or even at agency level. So the IT side of the business is crucial. Now, in generali, what we always try to do, especially when we believe in something and we have the size in that specific market, is make rather than buy. So try to build these solutions on our own because eventually we do not want to rely on someone else. But this is a general principle that does not apply across the board because in some countries in which we operate, we don't have the scale to go solo. And hence, a buy solution is far more applicable and potentially far faster in terms of market delivery. And if you look at international deals, in many cases, if you are to provide a common solution across different uh, markets, then building a platform that allows you to be multi-language, easily API'd, if I can use this uh, uh, new terminology, well, this is uh, potentially it is a, a competitive advantage. Thank you, Bruno. Um, it's very interesting. Um, well, we're much smaller than certainly big generali. We all have the same challenges. Do we build our own technology? Do we buy it? Do we partner with someone else? And I think 
one of my experiences uh, when I'm working with platform businesses, and this applies whether it's the traditional platforms, the banks and the telecom, as well as the technology partners, is I think there's a very uh, critical success factor of being able to launch programs quickly. And in the insurance industry, sometimes our, our, our notion of time is different than our platform partners. If I go to a platform partner and say, great idea, let's do this, we can launch in 18 months, they'll just, it's the end of the meeting. So the challenge is really how can we scale down from instead of months talking in weeks. So um, some of the key technology aspects that we look at is having a, a low code or no code platform where you can rapidly configure products. So instead of having to hire developers and develop everything from, from, from the start to leverage the existing technology. So all we really need to do is configure it, move some modules around that, the, and then that platform then builds the API, creates the connections to launch the, whether it's launching a web app or embedding directly into someone else's platform. And I also um, was listening, um, you each touched on the importance, not just on the front end of acquiring the customer and keeping those customer ac acquisition costs down, but also on the back end with claims. The claims process for embedded insurance is the same as, as traditional insurance. There's still a need for a notification of a claim, an assessment of a claim, uh, some kind of adjudication, um, and maybe an investigation, ultimately a settlement or payment. I think the difference with, to me, with embedded insurance is that process um, needs to be digitized. It's too expensive if we have uh, people involved, adjusters involved, lawyers involved. So this goes back to the need to create simple product insurance products, simple insurance products where the claim can be handled either predominantly or entirely through technology. And then for me, the the, the optimization is if we can then somehow get the claim paid directly to the, to the customer through some kind of a digital wallet. And that's where, whether it's a payment gateway or a telco, someone who has, the, or a bank has the ability to take the premium into the insurance company, but also to make the claims uh, payment out to those, to those uh, insureds when they do have a claim. Um, now I'm going to get to uh, the last question and it's a big one for me. We've talked a lot about you know, extending the protection gap, which I think that's important to all of us in our industry. But the big question is, can embedded insurance help to not only close the protection gap and expand the market, but also to drive growth and profitability for, for your companies? Um, in other words, this is not a, this is not a, a side business. This is not about just um, doing some good in the world, but this is core to your, your, your companies and how you grow and, and create profitability. And if you look into your your crystal ball, I'll, I'll use that uh, pun deliberately, but when you look into the into your crystal ball five years from now into the future, what does this look like? I'm going to ask uh, Eduardo if you could uh, start us uh, with uh, sharing your, your thoughts on this important topic. Yeah, sure. Uh, and, and the question is ab absolutely no. If, 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 this is a, if this is a three trillion market, uh, it is a one billion market in, in Central America today. Um, and, and as I mentioned at the beginning, I mean, em, em, embedded insurance and digital uh, is a means to uh, improving value creation, unlocking uh, unserved demand, customer experience, uh, and increasing in productivity. Um, I think um, um, the, the pandemic, you know, the events of the last two years, uh, uh, you know, got us uh, in, in a very strong financial position. Um, and we did, dedicated most of our resources to um, to, to think ahead, um, not just manage the the the, the pandemic, but also, you know see for the future. Um, and we've drawn greater need for for automation and efficiency. And I'm glad we accelerated uh, our digital initiatives. Simultaneously, uh, we have expanded our, our business ecosystem vision uh, across uh, the, the six countries. Um, and our IT has ramped up uh, integration capabilities uh, to externalize uh, our products and, and our processes. Um, so, you know, looking ahead, one of my goals is, is to continue accelerating this, uh, we call it the, this first phase of embedded insurance. Uh, whereby you know the traditional products uh, become more simple and are incorporated into marketplaces and platforms to approach that one billion on tap on surf market for us. 
Thank you, Eduardo. Uh, Bruno, uh, the same question for you. Uh, can embedded insurance help to close the production gap and expand markets while also driving growth and profitability? And what does the world look like for you five years from now? Okay, let me be uh, provocative here for just one second. Uh, I am not sure that the rise and establishment of embedded insurance will ultimately change the paradigm of our industry as being a push business rather than a pull one. I'm not sure that people will find fulfillment in buying insurance policies on a standalone basis from digital marketplaces, just to be clear. That said, there's such a under penetration of insurance solutions across pretty much every market, also in developed economies, that I think having an additional channel that would ultimately propose insurance uh, to customers to cover their gaps, especially in the protection space, is something that I would welcome also from a regulatory standpoint. The only caveat uh, or a point of attention is that embedded insurance needs to be embedded, but not too embedded, not to be uh, perceived as a value from customers. Because otherwise, it has a, an opportunistic stance that would ultimately become a detriment for the ones who provide these solutions, as well as change the perception of the value that customers have for what they've been purchasing. So it has to be something that we manage, and we manage properly, and we market properly, also in the context of other channels we might use to promote products with the same brand but with different features, potentially more sophisticated. And what I see in five years from now, well, I don't have a crystal ball for sure, uh, Jamie, but what I sense is that the opportunity a grasp is around building digital attackers that would allow companies to enter markets in which they do not enjoy established distribution means. And this can be an opportunity also in specific niches where technology and IT can be a distinctive competitive advantage with partners that are multinational. Where they are, with this I refer to OEMs, for example, or, uh, you know, re e retailers in the e-commerce space or, uh, um, you, you name it, um, utilities, anyone that has the opportunity to market the same value proposition in different countries would ultimately benefit from an embedded insurance carrier that can be a compelling partner. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. I really appreciate your, your comments, um, Eduardo, as well. Um, I think it's been a very interesting discussion. I hope our attendees for the conference have enjoyed it, and it's possibly helped to help you each to understand more about how I uh, send General, I think about the embedded insurance opportunity. Uh, the theme of our, our conference is the Great Reset, how the insurance industry will lead us forward. And I think embedded insurance is very much um, a part of this. While yes, we've all, we've all had uh, seen the world struggling over the past uh, couple of years, um, it has created some big opportunities uh, for us as well. And embedded insurance, while that's not going to be the only solution, it's not going to replace traditional insurance, it is to me a, a very substantial opportunity. And when I think of opportunity for me, it's an opportunity to serve a part of the market that today, and many people say is being underserved. I would postulate, and this is my provocative thinking. I think we're just, as an insurance industry, we're not serving. We're, there's a whole market that is being unserved today. I think particularly about the small and, and particularly the micro businesses as an industry have had a, a history of talking about SMEs. A lot of us, when we say SMEs, have meant really the M's, the mid-core, the middle market, the mid-sized customers. Part of that challenge is it's very expensive because of the frictional costs inherent in our business. So the challenge, which is to me, challenge equals opportunity, is how can we create products and distribution that serves the small end of the market, someone with one to 25 employees, someone who's never purchased insurance before, why do they need to have a $1 million USD limit on every insurance product that they buy? Why do we start our insurance at 5,000 US dollars or even 1,000 or even 500 US dollars? Why can't we provide insurance on a monthly basis or a subscription basis? 
There's a lot of thinking that we can do as an industry to help leverage these opportunities. We have all the skills, we have the capital, we have the technology, we can partner where it makes sense with other platform businesses. But I think for us as an industry, the opportunity is in front of us. Embedded insurance is one of the one of the solutions. But I think if we can we can leverage our existing strengths, maybe uh, take some risk. And 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 by that I mean the risk of a stumble, the risk of learning as we're going. Yes, we will misprice products, as Bruno said. Yes, we will have have some learn from our experience experiences, as Eduardo says. We will learn from those mistakes, and it will enable us to create the solutions for the future. So while I, I don't pretend to know what will happen five years from now either, I do know the opportunity is there today. And I think the growth rates are demonstrating certainly in the near term and the one to three year term that it is an, a substantial opportunity for all of us as an industry. And the key is how can we leverage our existing strengths to take advantage and to be able to, to pursue some of those opportunities together. Um, it's been a pleasure, and I, and on behalf of my uh, my uh, pa uh, my uh, panelists, Eduardo Fabreja and Bruno Scaroni, thank you so much for joining us here on this panel today. I think it's been a really insightful discussion, and I genuinely appreciate you sharing your opinions and your stories and your experiences with us. I'm sure it will be a great benefit to many of our peers on this at this conference who are thinking about how they can work with the embedded insurance space within their insurance businesses. Thank you both so much for your participation today. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Jamie, Eduardo, and Bruno for sharing their perspectives on this topic. As I mentioned, uh, when, I, when I introduced the panel, I thought you were gonna get a, a broad spectrum of both regional and global perspectives. And I think we got just that. Um, I really do see embedded insurance as one of those future products uh, for the industry. Of course, it's not gonna take away from the traditional one, but it certainly adds value as the customer experience is evolving. Um, what also is a benefit, I think, of a better insurance is that we're bringing risk management to the forefront, to actually bringing it to a point of sale of the product so that people can protect that product immediately and make sure that they're managing their risk, um, understanding that insurance will be there but also thinking about what the risk might be um, for whatever product they might be buying. And perhaps they'll look into the risk even more and take preventative measures, uh, whether again, it's driving more safely, uh, protecting your home from potential natural catastrophes, all of those things we want the customer to have that mindset more closer to the actual transaction. And that is what embedded insurance is meant to do. And so it'll be interesting to see how this evolves. Um, this industry is evolving quite well. I just recently had the opportunity to host a panel um, during one of the largest InsureTech events um, that we have every year called InsureTech Net. Um, nearly 8,000 people attended this, and you can really see, I've been in this position with I now for six years, and the amount of evolution in terms of innovation and embracing innovation um, is remarkable. And I think the InsureTech Connect event this year spoke to that. I think the embracing of embedded insurance and seeing that more and more in our marketplace is, is absolutely a good example of that. And I'm hoping that we'll see more because innovation, uh, while once maybe the question was, is this going to be an opportunity or a threat? I think more and more people are seeing that this is adding and enhancing the value chain. And certainly embedded insurance does enhance the value chain and the the actual experience that customer takes, especially especially for those younger generation who we know um, truly like the digital interactivity. Um, and so, again, I don't think it's going to replace the traditional product altogether, but I certainly uh, look forward to seeing it more and more in, as a product and a service because we want people to get to that insurance sooner and close that what we call protection gap. So. I'm Sean Kevlin. I'd like to again thank our panelists for this time. I'd like to thank you for joining us, and we'll hope to see you again soon.